Um, I guess let's start with the first slide. Uh, we got a talk, Python generators from yielding resources to weighting concurrency, and we're going to learn how to use generators to um, do multiple things at the same time or to save on resources on resource constrained devices and all kinds of fun things. So, possible to make the font a little bit bigger? Make the font bigger. Apple or uh, control plus. <clears throat> Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's good. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so this entire slide deck thing is uh, written in PyScript. I don't know if you guys have seen Jeff Glass's uh, talk on PyScript, and it's basically um, Python in the browser in WebAssembly, and uh, so we have a whole Python core running in here, and this whole thing is running in the browser. So that's super cool. Um, but anyways. Uh, each one of these slides here, um, we kind of have a, a little bit of markdown here so we can say what it's about. And then you'll see that there is some code here. And when the page is loaded, all the code that you see here is run um, on page load. And so you can see here, we've got, um, these things are going to be a little bit squished. Um, each one of these, we have a terminal. So you can type things in and you can see that we have this gen object, which is this generator of this generator function. So basically in the simplest form, you can think about, or I guess this is just my introduction, we'll get to the next one. Um, so again, my name is Andrew Wingate. Uh, I run a robotics company named Vezer, and this talk is about generators. So here you can see that we have just gone through a generator and we're yielding, um, values as we go. So again, generators uh, at their simplest form are iterators. You can use them um, and think about them just as iterators. And every time that you run next on them, they will yield a new value. So you can kind of think of yield like a return statement, except when we do this kind of stuff. So again, let's uh, get a value from our generator. <coughs> and you can see that we have gotten our first value, but then we can also, you know, in the same time here, <clears throat> do different things so we can um, start our generator, but we don't necessarily have to like finish it until we want the next value. So with generators, you go through, and as soon as you get to the end, you're going to get a um, exception and it's a stop iteration. So <clears throat> from that point, if you keep asking next, you'll keep getting this same exception. Uh, and then obviously you can just start a new one and go through to the end. And um, that's pretty much the simplest uh, way to think about generators. So here we'll continue on and you can see that um, you can use generators to uh, save time and memory. So in here, you know, if you were to have this as a list comprehension, uh, when this is calculated, you'd actually have to have a list with a trillion um, elements in it. And my computer would run out of memory and we wouldn't want to wait for this. Uh, our talk would be over before this is done. I know you all like Python, but it's kind of slow sometimes. Um, so again, um, we can look at our generator object here, and you can see that this is a generator expression. Um, if you guys are more familiar with this, you'll kind of notice that maybe this isn't uh, looking exactly like Python. Uh, I happen to be running MicroPython, um, PyScript, the MicroPython version. So some of the um, words that it says what it is isn't exactly the same as you'd see in Python 3. Um, but generally, the way that your usage is going to be, um, it's going to look uh, similar as it can. So again, we effectively like have a list of a trillion elements, and we can iterate through this thing um, and you know just lazily execute as we need more values. <clears throat> You can also stick generators in a for loop. So you can go and here I'm just having it um, kind of do a uh, number of beers, uh, bottles of beer on the wall. So we'll just hit sing here and you can see um, that here we're gonna go, you know, four beer in 
this function, this generator function, take down beers, we'll go ahead and just post to our terminal here. And you can see that we have gone all the way through this, but we never actually um, uh, had to handle the uh, stop iteration. But you'll see if we do this uh, just normally here, we'll do three, um, let's spell that right. Maybe I should have picked one. <laughs> <clears throat> and there we got our stop iteration. So <clears throat> you can see here that like um, you can use a for loop to go through uh, any kind of generator. And um, that's uh, another way to um, kind of go through them. Because again, you know, generators themselves don't actually do anything. Um, you actually have to have something else physically run through them and call next on them or whatever it is you want to do. Generators won't really do anything themselves. They do require a little bit of hand holding. So again, we've just gone through with a for loop. And <clears throat> in here, we'll introduce yield from. And you can kind of think of yield from. This one was a little bit interesting when I first started seeing it. But yield from, you can kind of think of it like an, an implicit for loop um, on another generator. So as we go through here, um, we have a little uh, generator comprehension. Um, we have a list. We have. Uh, another dictionary there and then a string at the end and you can see that as we start going through these things um, we are just iterating through each one in a time and um, until we hit our stop iteration so this yield from is pretty powerful when you're uh, wanting to have a bunch of tasks all together and you can kind of uh, use that to um, as syntactic sugar to just help keep things uh, looking pretty, like we like to do in Python. <clears throat> Continuing on, we can kind of start to build some kind of pipelines. Um, and again, uh, this kind of becomes a little bit more important when you're using something like uh, resource constrained devices um, and you can't really uh, you know, create an entire list or write to a file or execute the entire thing before you um, want to actually uh, use any of the values that you would be uh, pulling out of here. So again, this is the uh, bottles of beer on the wall. And we can now um, you know, kind of nest our functions in here. Um, we have the takedown again. But then in here, we're also going to uh, sing more of the verses and actually like have the entire song. So let's go ahead and run this one. And you can see here. Um, we have sung through the entire song, uh, five, four, three, two, one, zero bottles. Um, maybe it's time to find another bar. And also, I guess this is a good time to mention, I don't know if it was mentioned by Phil, uh, but all of us usually will meet at a bar afterwards. Do we know which one we're going to? Uh, Blue Aqua Hotel Bar. Okay, uh, come find us at Blue Aqua if we want to continue these conversations. <clears throat> So we have looked at generators just as a um, iterable. So, you know, we're going through and it's just like, let's have some values back, let's have some values back. And um, that's pretty simple, but uh, you can also send something into generators. And so if you kind of look here, um, let's go ahead and just start this guy off. So we have created this simple generator here. And the first thing, I don't know if we can fit all this on the screen at the same time. Okay, I think we got this. Um, so with generators, again, they always need a little bit of hand holding. So you can see that we have this generator object gen here. And before you can do anything, you always need to start a generator. And to start it, you'll always call next. Even if there isn't anything to do, you're always going to have to kind of um, baby it along and like get it started. So you can see here that we have called next. You can see that we've run past this post. But now we are at this yield right here. And this is where generators start to be uh, really interesting. And you can do uh, very interesting things here um, because we can now go gen and send 
<coughs> so we have our generator and we will call the send method on it. And let's just go, hello, Chippy. Hippie? <laughs> no hippies? <laughs> <clears throat> so when we send this uh, value in here, it is actually going to end up going in and value now is going to be what we send in. And um, we've just now gotten to this line, you know, value equals value in this case, hello Chippy, and we have now gotten to this <clears throat> next yield statement. Let's go ahead and just send in this five. Oops. Oh yeah, that is actually correct. That's what's supposed to happen. So you can see here that we gave in the value five. We now have second value equals five. There are no more yield statements. We have completed this, um, and now we raise our stop iteration. Um, <clears throat> yes, a quick question. Yes, of course. What would have happened if you would have called next on that instead of sending the value? Great question. Uh, that is a great question. Why don't we just do this? Uh, so, for the recording. What's up? Repeat the question for the recording. Oh, uh, yes. So the question was, what happens if you, uh, instead of sending send, if you just called next on this? So let's go ahead and look at that. So we have created this simple generator again. We will call next on it to get it going. We've gotten past our first yield. It is going to now want a value. So now, instead of hitting send, we're going to go next on this generator. And you'll see here that it actually did send something. It just sent none. Um, and so it's not going to break anything unless your program is expecting um, something. And typically in these, I think that you're probably going to be expecting um, some kind of value to be passed in there. Um, so. Why does it send none? I'm sorry? Why does it send none? Um, that is a question that is above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, if, if you don't mind the line of course. coding, coding to, feel free to punt on this. Uh, can we try doing a for in gen instead of next oh, thing on it? Ah. Yeah, I think that's useful to show, because if I remember right, I think when you iterate through it using the for syntax, you get the sugar of uh, it catches the the, the uh, stack and then just like print G or something. Or, um, we'll see if it works. But I remember right. I think that's supposed to be the behavior. Yeah, I did that right. I can find that. Um, oh, uh, let's open up the terminal here. And we can skip it if it's. Like, I'm sorry. We can skip it if it becomes a distraction. Oh no, it's just uh, something. These aren't real REPL prompts, and so mm -hmm. you can see that I passed in a non-breaking space character, and Python's like, "I'm I'm out." Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> oh. uh, so we should still have our generator object here. We do, um, and now we are going to. Um, actually, we never needed it, right? Because we are creating a new one. Um, yeah. I think this has something more to do with my not quite REPL prompt REPL. Um, one of the greatest things about Python is it's written in Python. So you can do dumb things, but sometimes you end up with, uh, with oh, dumb yeah, results. Yeah, thanks for trying to. <laughs> um, all right, so we have this little more uh, not so simple um, one here. So uh, let's go ahead and spin that one up. Um, so can we guess what's going to happen when we next this guy? Are we going to get anything back? We get a five because we have this five right in front of the yield here. So if it's past the yield, it's going to yield that when you next on it. So this not so simple example, we have now reached this yield. It has yielded this five. That's the first next. Now we want to send something in so we can send 10. And then you can see that we have gotten our 10 back. So again, we start this guy. It yields five because that's on the right side. And then we can send a value in 
and we're just yielding that right back to us, um, in which case you'll get whatever it is back. Um, I know that this syntax is not the most friendly thing in the world, um, but that's what it is. So let's continue on. <clears throat> And uh, now we'll try to uh, have some concurrency. So we're going to have some multiple um, generators going here. Let's go ahead and close this terminal. Um, I have uh, just created this object here called Gene, and Gene can basically hold on to a bunch of generator objects. So we'll just have like a um, key value store here with uh, a dictionary of our gens, the name of it, and we can um, just hold on to those and um, <clears throat> it will also hold on to its own generator, which is generating through the generators. So we have a generator, generator, generating through generators. <clears throat> so um, I kept this here, so we'll go gene.startParty, and this will kind of get to things and get things going. And um, you'll kind of see where some of this uh, comes in later as we um, kind of pull open the sheets on some of this stuff. So essentially, here um, we can say <coughs> next to gene, and um, it'll get back to us and say we currently have no uh, generators. And you can see that we have no generators here. Um, and so there's there's nothing to give us. So let's go ahead and create one. Um, and if you're wondering why these buttons are out of order, um, it's because when I created these, they are uh, all dictionaries. And you guys don't know how good you have it now that dictionaries in Python 3 all hold, they preserve order. Um, but that wasn't always the case. And that is not the case if you're using MicroPython. Um, the order of your dictionaries will be um, not random, but ordered on the hash value. Were you going to say something? Arbitrary. Oh. <laughs> no order dict in MicroPython? There is, uh, but the, for the sake of this, I was just keeping things simple, um, which makes the buttons not simple. There is order dict, yes. Um, but uh, I figured I would leave that one just so that I could pass along that little nugget of, um, you know, you don't know how good you young kids have it nowadays. Yeah? <laughs> so uh, now I've asked Gene to create this generator called Alpha, and um, you can see that it has one. And now when we uh, ask for a value, it's going to say, oh, yeah, I have this generator called Alpha, and we are now yielding the first value. We can go ahead, another one we're yielding on, um, and now like let's create another generator. So we can do beta, and as we go here, now we have beta, now we have alpha. Again, this is micro, micro Python. We have a dictionary object. It is not preserving any kind of order, so we don't get any kind of order as we're kind of uh, iterating back through these things. Um, let's go ahead and uh, just do delta and gamma. We'll start going through here. And you can see now that we have a bunch of different generators, all at different values. And um, they're kind of all doing their thing. We can do other things in the meantime. Um, we'll just post some more, you know, hi. Um, we're going through these, but we don't necessarily have to finish. We can just like throw it on a shelf, do some compute over here, come back, continue on. We will just keep continuing on here. And you can see that um, you know, our object here, Gene, has uh, gracefully <clears throat> handled our exception here of when we got to the end of our um, generator and gracefully just like deleted it from the list. And we can continue on. So um, can anyone guess what this Gene object is very close to that we use in Python? No one uses async IO? OK. <laughs> we got people who love threads and callbacks. The process. Or processes, yes. The process. <laughs> uh, so um, well, anyways, yeah, this should 
should look familiar uh, for anybody who is used to async IO. Um, you know, we have this create gen uh, function up in Gene. We, this is synonymous with create task. Um, start party, you know, we get our event loop, run forever. Um, and this kind of do gens thing is handled under the hood uh, with, uh, with async IO and our um, iterator. Uh, yes. Or is this kind of how it's implemented in pure Python, kind of the demonstration you're giving us? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, let's go ahead. I'm going to hide that little picture first. Um, so you can see here that, like, uh, I have a, an async function. So we have async IO here. Um, we've created an async function here called delayed posts. And you'll see here that if we, um, yes. Uh, That's from the end. Yep. That when we asked uh, delayed post what it is, we actually get back a generator object. So to continue on with that one, uh, for any kind of generator function, <coughs> creating an object that you want to await on, uh, it will have to have a um, dunder method of a next and a another one that I cannot remember the name of. Um, but those are the two dunder methods that async IO is going to want any kind of object to have when it is um, uh, kind of iterating through these things and you have some kind of function that is awaitable. I think it's um, a iter. That is the one. That is correct, yes. Uh, yeah, and I believe that AIDR basically is like the generator object itself. So up in our, um, uh, up here, we actually like create gen um, and we actually are yielding a generator back. Uh, that would be the AIDR function is like create me an iterator of self and pass it back so that um, the event loop can pick it up and start uh, working on it. <clears throat> so, uh, again here, um, you can see here that as we're doing this, um, we are just waiting for a period of time as we're doing this. Uh, and again, we can just kind of load it up here and now um, things can uh, be handled concurrently. Okay. So I come from the JavaScript world where like an async function can be written in non-async JavaScript. Is there an equivalent way to do that in Python? Uh, okay, yes. Actually, sorry, that was the picture that I that was the said, gene class. get back to this one. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a wonderful question. Um, okay, so uh, we have this and in JavaScript it is a little bit different and you can have the you can have generate they aren't separated as nicely as Python wants to have them uh, but you do end up in a similar kind of situation where it's like okay yes I have some function I have a function more functions and then all of a sudden you bring in this async guy and um, you know everyone <laughs> <laughs> has to kind of change to uh, Go with the paradigm here that like you know we have these uh, awaitable functions and as soon as you start adding some of these in then it kind of uh i'm not going to say pollutes your code base but like your code base needs to now be like geared towards uh async io or any of these kind of um uh async functions borg. i'm sorry or like the borg <laughs> could be i don't know i found this on the internet <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's uh, async IO. And um, so I think that I'm kind of running out of time here. So um, uh, I have another one of these robots here, and uh, it has a suction cup and can move around and play a game of checkers. So I figured I would just kind of uh, show you a little bit of what that program looked like. Um, and I'm actually curious of uh, how you guys feel about some of this. Um, so anyways, the, the board is uh, kind of fashioned like this in the code. We have columns A, B, C, and D, and we have the uh, rows here, one through eight. 
Um, if anybody is offended that I didn't start with zero, you should be using iterators anyways and just go away. <laughs> um, so let's take a look at, uh, at our code here. Um, again, for it's, it's for a machine uh, just like this. <coughs> so we have a couple constants up at the top. Uh, about how we're going to move and where we're going to move some things. We have also uh, created our board. Uh, in these, it's actually the uh, the joint angle <coughs> is going to be each one of the um, squares on the checkerboard. And uh, as we move on here, um, let's kind of start from the bottom here. Um, these are the moves. So like I showed you the board, um, you can move a piece from D3 to C4 or from C6, we're going to remove it from the board. Um, and this is some famous game or something like that. So again, more stuff I found on the internet. I guess I could have asked ChatGPT to make me a game, right? Um, Why are there only four columns instead of eight? Uh, well, you only play on the black. OK. Right? So like, you could, but then my stupid human brain, as I'm trying to like figure out which pieces should move to there, um, didn't like having to like do some extra math, okay. of whether I'm on the even or odds. So um, computers are fast. Python is wonderful. Let's just uh, let, uh, let Python take care of it. And you can see uh, right here, um, you know, this is where we're going to actually go in here and figure out like which um, list element we're going to look for to actually uh, pass back to tell the robot to move there. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and just like start this game here. And as we call next on this, we are going to start getting uh, some of these um, values back. And I guess here is where I'd kind of be interested to feel, see how you guys feel about this, like on the inside. Um, so when classically on machines, uh, they run this code called G code. And so for a code like this first one, command move out linear, that would be G1, because all the functions are just, um, serialized and then you pass in some quarks so in this case you know you'd have uh, x15 y some other value and then feed at some so basically this is move in a straight line to some point and the from is implicit based on where the machine is at the moment um, but i'm just curious of like what do you guys when you guys look at this is this something like how does it make you feel on the inside I'm offended you didn't use chess notation. <laughs> <Not that simple. laughs> I did look at it and I was like, I just didn't want to build the parser. So it's okay. I should have. Uh, yeah, I don't quite should've, understand it. I think you should have made an enum with all the offsets and the commands. Uh, all the offsets as a command? Like x122.0 is like an enum instead for the offset. Um, the numbers here. Yeah. Uh, well, those values are just like passed in. What do you mean an enum? Like a table instead of like hard coding one two two. Uh, it's not. So this is a generator again. Like we are running uh, this program here. So I guess we'll we'll kind of walk through this here real quick. Uh, we have this play game and we're passing in our game object. Um, our game object is this list of strings here. So these are the moves. Oh. Uh, our first one is move from D3 to C4. So effectively, it is moving to D3, which is at this 122, um, 14 number. So we've just said, I want you to move. We have a piece over here. Move above it. And then the next one is move down. And then this next one, um, we're just saying evaluate this function, we have this object called suck, which is the suction cup. We're like in hardware land now and turns it on. Waits for a little bit so the motor can do its thing and we can uh, actually get a vacuum going, move back up, move to the next location, which in this case would be C4. <coughs> like we should be able to, I believe, um, That should work, right? Yeah. So, you know, position C4, uh, what return gets returned back to us is this XY location. So that's, oh, that's just the XY notation of the sucker, right? Uh, 
Yeah, this is where the black square is on the checkerboard. Is it the is it like the center of the square or is it like the, a corner of the yeah, square? Yeah, it's the center of the of the square. Um, so I have a video that'll be posted soon about how I did this, but basically there's encoders on the side of here and I kind of just like dragged it around and I just started hitting a button and it just created oh. this table. Um, oh, so you didn't you didn't write the G code? Did you, did you? Uh, well, again, like the G code is coming from, like everything that you see here is just coming from this Python code. Mm. Yeah. So um, Python code creates G code and then it's interpreted by machine. Uh, so, <clears throat> I get, yeah, so what I'm asking you guys is like, you know, G code is gross and nobody should be writing it. Yeah. <laughs> it should just go away. Uh, what, what are you asking us? Uh, just how it makes you feel on the oh. inside. Is this ugly? <laughs> is there some other way that you think that like um, you would want to tell a machine um, to do something? <laughs> well, uh, this, I would just say this reminds me of like turtle or a logo, mm -hmm. you all, you know, turn left, turn right, mm -hmm. and up and down kind of thing. And I'm just thinking in terms of that, the, uh, the only thing that's confusing here is simply <coughs> the fact that you have to specify things by like, you know, XY position or something nice about logo, or I guess the turtle was like, it seemed more. Um, so these are absolute positions and you can do say. relative programming as well. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, if you, I have this kind of working, I don't know, I don't really like relative programming. Yeah. Um, because like, now you have to think about where it was. Right. Um, and again, when you're writing something like Python, it can go ahead and just like dig through a whole list and kind of figure stuff out and just do the math for you. The fact that you moved it five is arbitrary and whether or not you want to does it move to origin after each move, or does it can it go from whatever square to whatever square? Does it have to move back? No, it can go from whatever square to whatever other square. Okay. Um, and I guess one of the other things that's kind of going to be missed by this is the fact that, like, when you're telling a machine to do something, um, let's say that you have uh, something you're going to move from this point to this point to this point, and they're all in a line, you don't actually want to move and then stop and then move and then stop again. Hmm. You have to fill up a buffer of the moves and it's like, oh, I'm at this speed when I hit this point and I'm just going to crash right through it and continue on to the next one. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of a, a dance that has to happen there where you like have buffers and things have to happen. You have to think about the future before you actually um, pass it to the robot. Yeah, in a, in a previous life I worked in supply chain and I worked with manufacturers that were using uh, you know, like three axis machines <laughs> and writing machine code, writing G code, they have like CAM software that will optimize those paths. So like you're saying, you know, I, if I want to mill, you know, the face of something, it'll, it'll kind of say like, these are the speeds at each end you should be at and, and how it moves. So it's like a program that writes it out for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And kind of, um, what's sort of implied with some of this, and I'm asking how you feel about this. Um, nobody really should be writing very much G code at all. No, it's uh, I talked to high school, I'm a journeyman um, machinist as well. Oh, okay. I was running CNC machines, I went to college, okay. and they taught me G code. And I'm like, yeah. I was already running the giant machining centers. And I'm like, nobody should be writing this ever. Well, like, it's like, should I learn assembly? No, you shouldn't. Exactly, you exactly. Uh, you might be delighted to know that I've talked to you college students lately, and they are still teaching it. Oh. Um, and in relative mode, and like, with offsets and all this like idiotic stuff, it's like, human brains aren't meant to write assembly or G code or any of these things. Let's, uh, let's bring it up to a higher level. Thanks. Yes. They correctly looking for me like doing the moves all in like a virtual board and then um, if the, the, the thing could just decide what to do based on where it's, where the <coughs> current position is and where the destination position, position is. You just like it, the virtual board says move from square A to B, but that would translate to a decode as a separate interface. Do those moves, maybe? Um, yeah, there's kind of a lot that can happen under the hood, especially uh, with a robot like this. Um, so the question was, you know, um, when you're asking a machine to move from one place to another, it's not necessarily one command. 
Is that uh, kind of uh, what you're getting at? And especially with a machine like this, it's like move.linear. We want to move in a straight line, but a robot arm has no concept of straight lines. So a straight line to us actually is an arc uh, when you're talking about it for a robot. Uh, All right, I'll take the mic. So you were asking about how we feel about it. Yeah. And, and I hear you defending how it works, which is, I totally hear that. But ultimately, like if I, I wouldn't buy this because it's too much detail upfront. You know, mm -hmm. this data of the G code, I'm not, is that what you said, G code? Uh, well, I'm also hunting for a word for it because like, yeah. there are no kind of like high level, I haven't found anything like it. Okay, that's fine. Um, this so. is called G code. All I'm, my, my feeling about it is it'd be cool to get different levels of debugging information out of this. Mm -hmm. Like what you're talking about with, with the virtual board would be more accessible to me working on this thing. And like, oh, this is moving from whatever. It's abstract, it's not direct code for the robot. I want to go deeper and see, okay, actually, what is the XY coordinate? What is the G code on it? I'd like to be able to access that as needed, but if it's only showing me code like that, then my feeling is overwhelm <laughs> and confusion. Okay. Is that what you're asking for? No, yeah, that's that's fair. That's okay. fair. Um. I actually, to, um, to inform my own feelings, I looked up G code and I agree with you that this is better. You should just call it like macro Python. So <laughs> you use it for macro thingies. It's very that's assembly like, so I that's see a very what you mean. interesting uh, concept there. Okay, very cool. Um, okay, I guess we can uh, we can move on. Um, so again, you know, what this ends up getting compiled down to uh, currently for the machine, we have we have a whole um, program up here. It's written in Python. Um, but then once it becomes compiled, uh, this is kind of like looking at machine code. Um, and uh, actually, I think that um, this is our last slide. So uh, thank you. Um, if you want to find out more, um, you can go ahead and look at this link, and I'll be posting more updates and everything on what I'm doing. Yep. You showed the example, so you know, obviously you can do the yield, you can post um, like the for loop of the while loop, you can iterate through it. That's not making an automated set. Automate the fact that I don't know how to do next. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, is there something similar for that for um, ascend? So like, why do you want to send a bunch of stuff? Yeah, it is. Uh, like, uh, you showed how you can yield, yield and wait and then take input and send. Uh, and send uh, wait and report. Pass that send, yeah, send value in. So you can have like the two gears to the cranking uh, at the same time. One yielding and one sending. Well, I mean, if, if I'm reading what you're saying correctly, um, you know, you're going to you have to get these values from somewhere. So you're probably just going to be kind of building something yourself where you're iterating through some kind of iterable and passing the sending these values to some other generator over here. And you're just kind of having some function that's sort of just doing this thing. Uh, and then I guess the last thing I was just going to uh, start up the robot and um, hope you guys are curious of um, this whole slide deck here. Uh, here's a uh, programming environment that I'm creating to help make these so you can drag hardware objects on here like the suction cup or the pan or servos or any of these things and kind of uh, put them together. I know that I've kind of uh, abused it here a little bit, but um, so it's Python on the back end. You can run it on the ESP32, which is running MicroPython, or just run it right in the browser. Um, so I think that it's kind of neat, but let's... Uh, sorry, the... Like yeah. Zoom thing keeps getting in my way. So this is the website that is being served by the robot over here. Uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to. I think I did this already. Um, we're just going to draw another chip design. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.